It was built like a prehistoric tank, its body covered in armor. Huge spikes jutted from its back, and its tail worked like a chainsaw. Its name was Gastonia. But it lived and fought with the most terrifying creature on Earth. Utah Raptor, a giant super-sized raptor. Now, scientists are digging up dirt to uncover how these real-life monsters were forced to fight for survival in the most brutal of terrains. They're the Earth's first fighters, the ultimate predators. New discoveries in forensic science bring to life the prehistoric art of war. This is Jurassic Fight Club. The mystery begins in October 1989. The place, Moab, Utah. Dinosaur expert Robert Gaston is on a routine search for fossils when he happens upon a discovery. It would rock the prehistoric world. I was walking along the bottom of the mesa, and the mesa had brightly colored bands of, of purple and green soils on it. And so in walking along the bottom, I found a piece of armored dinosaur askew in a piece of this green clay. And I could see where it had rolled down because it was a, a fresh, uh, freshly eroded piece. So I followed that up to the layer where it appeared to be coming out. And once I got to the layer, uh, there were dinner plate sized pieces of armor. You could see vertebra in the rock. And so I knew that there was you know, quite a bit of this animal in, in the ground there. Gaston had no idea he was about to unearth one of the earliest armored dinosaurs, a giant porcupine-like monster previously unknown to science. I realized that what I found was scientifically significant fairly early on. Um, how significant, I didn't realize. But I knew that armored dinosaurs weren't really well known. And because their bones are so distinctive, being whole pieces of armor, it was easy to see that it was probably some type of animal like that. And so I began to realize the, the ramifications that you know, not only was this thing you know, fairly important, but it was going to shed a whole new light on a, on a branch of animals that was poorly known in North America. Armored dinosaurs would not become common until tens of millions of years after the Gastonia lived. Gaston called in noted paleontologist Dr. James Kirkland to analyze this historic find. It takes me around to get down on my hands and knees and look under this bottom shelf. And it's this rock about four feet by about a foot and a half across. And look at it and realize it's the hip bones and a shield of fused armor. And he found this thing rolled off a hill a few miles north of Moab. And they took me out and said, hey, we just found it. We knew someone one of these days would come in and know its importance, and they turned it over to me. Dr. Kirkland and his team dug up the remaining bones and categorized and classified this new species. They would later name it after its discoverer, Robert Gaston, calling it Gastonia. Gastonia was a stout but formidable dinosaur four-legged creature that was built like a Sherman tank. It stood about three feet tall, was 15 feet long, and weighed a ton. And it was covered in weapons. Gastonia is the spiniest of all the ankylosaurs. And when you think of the ankylosaurs, these are the heavily armored, tank-like dinosaurs. Then, scientists realized something remarkable. This animal's armor was actually embedded in the skin. There are lots of armored dinosaurs, and many of them have armor uh, plates, flat plates on its body. Some of them have spikes on its body. Gastonia has a lot of spikes on its body, huge spines coming off its shoulder and its sides. So it was sort of like a walking armored pincushion. This dinosaur was unlike any other. Other dinosaurs, such as Stegosaurus, had body armor. 
but none had the complete protection that Gastonia had. The first defense was its armored hips. One of the interesting things about Gastonia is it does have a big uh, solid plate over its hips. This makes sense when you think about um, the fact that that would probably be maybe one of the more, more vulnerable areas of Gastonia. They didn't have a lot of neck mobility, so they're probably not able to wheel around and, and see the hips as well. So that probably helps serve as added protection for the, the easiest part of the animal for a predator to potentially get to. It was a supremely defended dinosaur. But this living tank also had a weapon designed for offense. Huge spines. This is a spine from the shoulder region that would have stuck out laterally. Now, like the other armor we see in these animals, it's covered with numerous small grooves that house blood vessels. These blood vessels, in turn, would have helped grow the keratinaceous sheath that would have covered the spine, and in turn, would also covered all the low armor, the bone, over the whole body of the animal. His back is covered in pieces of body armor. He's got huge spikes that jut out of his back. He's tough to get near, but his most effective weapon was his tail. All the way down the length on both sides of the tail were sharp pieces of bone that acted like blades. Its tail was a lethal weapon. Jutting out of the sides of the tail were large triangular shaped razors. And Gastonia wielded it like a medieval mace. Paleontologists know that he used it in a pivoting motion. Well, as Gastonia would pivot around and move its body, keep that hind end toward any predatory dinosaur, it would be slashing this tail back and forth. Of course, you have these large triangular plates running down the tail that, if they came together, would be able to slice something. I tend to liken the tail of a Gastonia to a big chainsaw blade on a handle, slashing back and forth at you. You wouldn't want to grab it. And if that chainsaw tail, body armor, and back spines were not enough to take down any predator, it had one additional weapon that was unknown to modern science until the discovery of Gastonia. A set of bone-slicing shears. At the base of the tail where it connects to the hips, Gastonia had these sharp, triangular-shaped plates made of bone. In and among themselves, they were pretty nasty weapons. But looking more closely at them, paleontologists saw something amazing. When this dinosaur swung its tail from side to side, these things crossed each other and acted like a pair of bone-slicing shears. The fossil evidence indicated that Gastonia was one of the most well-protected dinosaurs on Earth. But he had a weakness. This large complement of body armor and weaponry made this dinosaur very slow. Gastonia would have been a relatively slow-moving, plant-eating dinosaur. It probably spent its day wandering around, finding vegetation to eat. Because it was so heavily armored, it could only eat low vegetation, so ferns, and cycad plants, and low-lying shrubs. Then, the investigation took an unexpected turn. Lawrence Whitmer of Ohio University was able to use powerful CT scans to peer through the armored skulls of dinosaurs like Gastonia. What he discovered was intriguing. Scientists now know that this tank was not an intelligent dinosaur, but had a powerful sense of smell and hearing. When we look at the brain of, of ankylosaurs like Gastonia, what we see is still a relatively simple kind of structure. One thing that is kind of expanded, though, is the olfactory centers, the centers associated with, with the sense of smell. They're actually considerably enlarged, suggesting that smell was very important to these animals. We also see in the inner ear of these animals that the, uh, the part associated with hearing was also remarkably uh, well-developed suggesting that hearing as well as smell were particularly important. But the CT scans uncovered something else. A look at the vision center of the skull showed that Gastonia had poor eyesight. 
In the brain, we don't see tremendous expansion of the optic centers, the visual centers associated with processing visual information. That have a really low head posture. These are not animals that can, in a sense, scan the horizon for predators. And so vision really would only be useful at close distances in terms of seeing a predator. You really want to detect a predator before it gets close enough for you to be able to see it. And so they potentially use other senses, like the sense of smell. With its limited visual capability, Gastonia had to rely on a keen sense of smell and hearing to keep it alert for potential predators. But that meant scientists had to consider an intriguing possibility. Could it have had another early warning system? There are a lot of symbiotic relationships between animals today, and I have no doubt whatsoever that they existed in the past. Look at modern rhinos. They have poor sense of vision, so they rely on birds to alert them to approaching danger. These birds, in turn, are protected from their own predators by the rhino. I think that small pterosaurs would have had the same symbiosis with Gastonia. They would have been protected by the Gastonia, and in return, they would have warned it of potential danger. But with its incredible array of weapons and defensive armor, why would Gastonia even need an early warning system? Its only vulnerability was its underbelly, which was not armored. But what sort of creature could possibly have been strong enough and smart enough to reach it? The answer lay nearby. 50 yards away, paleontologists found fossil evidence of exactly why Gastonia would need an early warning system. Near the town of Moab, Utah, dinosaur hunter Robert Gaston discovered the remains of Gastonia, a one-of-a-kind armored dinosaur from the early Cretaceous. He had no idea that lying nearby was a second species, unknown to modern science. Only this one was a predator. And as investigators would soon discover, this was no ordinary killer. Uh, we had been working in the quarries. We were starting to get familiar with how the bones were uh, situated. And one of the, uh, the students that were, was with the College Eastern Utah uh, yelled over to me, uh, said, Jim, you should come over and look at this. It looks a little different. I'm looking down at it. And I realize that there's a little groove on the surface. And I hold my head down low and realize, boy, this is real thin. That looks like the groove you see inside of a claw, but it's really thin. And I thought to myself, Deinonychus, terrible claw from the early Cretaceous. This is good, one of my favorite dinosaurs. I said, this is twice as big as Deinonychus. Scientists had just unearthed the remains of a giant raptor one that was over 12 times as heavy as its next largest relative. They named this beast Utah Raptor. Very soon after uh, beginning to excavate the Gastonia bones, we uh, uncovered a claw approximately eight inches in length, and through analysis of other specimens, it was determined that this was a gigantic uh, dromaeosaur, which is the family of dinosaurs that Velociraptor and Deinonychus and things like that belong to, and so this was very exciting because it was the largest dromaeosaur known, and not only was it larger than anything known, but it was several times larger than anything previously seen. The Utah Raptor preceded the Velociraptor by tens of millions of years. This was clearly an early version of the smaller, faster raptors to come. When Utahraptor was found, it was pretty significant because up until that point, the largest of the raptor dinosaurs found was Deinonychus, which was about the size of a timber wolf. And here comes one with similar sort of anatomy, but bigger than a bear, or at least the size of a big grizzly, or a big polar bear, a, a truly monstrous sized raptor dinosaur. I think someone gave a really good explanation of what 
Utah Raptor was. Utah Raptor was Velociraptor on steroids. Here's the pumped up Raptor. This is the biggest Raptor we found so far, and it was probably the nastiest as well. Utah Raptor. Its name means Thief of Utah. It's the largest known member of the early dromaeosaurids, which were bird-like, meat-eating dinosaurs. It killed by pouncing onto the back of its prey. If I were to design the perfect killing machine, I'd build a raptor. If I was going to build the perfect raptor, I'd build a Utah raptor, because it's the right size for killing almost anything. Utah Raptor stood nearly six feet tall, the height of a modern human. But it was almost four times as long as it was tall and weighed in at over 1,500 pounds. It also had long, powerful forelimbs ending in three blade-like claws. Its hind legs were short and sturdy with feet that each held his number one weapon, a nine to 15 inch retractable sickle-shaped claw that's why it was given the nickname, Super Slasher. This is from the foot of Utah Raptor. And it's unlike the claws and the feet of, of, of other theropods in that it's very narrow. You can see it's narrow in, in the section. And based on looking at the claws of modern birds, we realize this sheath is probably another third longer than this. So it come out and come out here and go down here before it got to a point. And also the sheath came to a sharp edge down here, much like a knife. This supports the idea that they use this killer claw by putting it in and then pulling it along. Picture this animal being able to kick this thing with slashing strokes, three, four, five foot long strokes, plunge it in through skin an inch thick, slash down 10 inches deep and cut three feet long and do that every couple seconds. The discovery of the massive claws of Utah Raptor proved that it was a formidable killer. But investigators kept digging and found something more. Broken teeth lay scattered nearby. They were from the Raptor. They were small, very sharp, and deadly. This is the Utah Raptor tooth. It's not that impressive, perhaps, because the skull was, you know, perhaps about this long or so. But here you can see it. It hasn't got a sharp point because this was used in life and it was worn and it was shed. You see the little wear facets on here. The Utah Raptor's teeth were small, but very sharp. They were not long enough to be effective weapons. They were designed for tearing and chewing prey more than attacking. The teeth of Utah Raptor were ideal for slicing meat, but there's no way they could hold up against the body armor of Gastonia. So it makes sense that if Utah Raptor decided to attack a Gastonia, we would expect to find broken Raptor teeth. Utah Raptor had three major weapons. The most important, was its large brain, which was as razor sharp as its super slasher claws. CT scanning revealed a higher than average intellect. When we do CAT scan of, of raptor skulls, uh, we can see that the, these raptors, like Utah Raptor, had really fairly expanded brain, expansion of the higher centers of the brain the parts of the brain that are associated with maybe even some cognitive capabilities, ability to solve problems. These guys had a pretty doggone advanced brain, very much like living birds of today. Very smart, smart animals. Don't mess with the raptor, you're gonna lose. The second was his remarkable vision. With a tall stature and incredibly sharp eyesight, this raptor had a commanding view of everything within its environment. And we also see expansion of the visual centers of the brain that actually become apparent, suggesting that vision is becoming increasingly important for these raptors, like Utah Raptor. One distinctive characteristic that all members of the raptor family share is remarkable vision. Utah Raptor was no different. Having good vision is clearly the mark of a chase you down and kill you sort of predator. They had the eyesight of an eagle. 
What's interesting is that we can actually look at their inner ear and see many of those same features that we see in birds in their inner ear, suggesting that these animals also use very rapid, quick turning movements of their head, and they were highly coordinated, so they could turn their eyes and their head and their neck very rapidly, and at the same time, keeping their gaze fixed on a target. Like all raptors, Utah raptor was one of the top predators of its time. But unlike its cousins, this raptor was not built just for speed. His short but robust legs meant that this meteor was a heavyweight. Because of Utah raptor's large size and um, proportion of the leg bones, it's it's pretty safe to assume that it was slower than what we think of as Velociraptor and Deinonychus. Utahraptor may have been more of an ambush predator. In other words, we might say that if Velociraptor were a cheetah running things down, that Utahraptor may have been the equivalent of a lion in the sense that it may have lay in wait for prey. Utahraptor would normally have preyed on less well-armored herbivores ones which were less likely to inflict injury. But the fact that the skeleton of Gastonia was found nearby proves that they did share the same terrain. The area where they found the skeleton of Utah Raptor and Gastonia looks a lot different today than it did when they were alive. Although there were large conifer trees, this particular part of the state was a bit more open and dry. It sort of resembled a savanna, but without grass. Utah Raptor hunted this area because it allowed him to see prey over greater distances. Gastonia was attracted to the area because of the amount of low-growing vegetation, something you don't find in the big, dense forests. Scientists realized that for most of the year, life flourished on the ancient savanna. But during the dry season, the environment would take a turn for the worst have a number of uh, uh, fossil soils preserved uh, that set, suggest there were periods of extreme aridity, perhaps extensive drought. In fact, some of these extensive uh, drought intervals might be responsible for some of the fossil sites that we found. Drought conditions meant that herbivores would have less to eat. The weaker ones would either migrate or die. This forced the predators to look harder for prey, attacking whatever they could find, no matter how well defended. During times of drought, animals are stressed to the limit. Normal behavior is basically thrown out the window, and it becomes a no holds bar fight for survival. If Utah Raptor and Gastonia happened to me, and I, I think they would have tended to avoid each other, but if environmental factors such as extreme drought, uh, food deprivation, that sort of thing, um, forced uh, unpleasant interaction, I would tend to think that, like all predators, Utah Raptor would be forced to assess the, the health conditions of the Gastonia. But with Gastonia, it's very tough to figure out a place where there was a chink in the armor. But there was one piece of evidence that puzzled experts. When scientists studied the Gastonia skeleton, they found no gashes in the bone. Why not? Dinosaur expert George Blassing has an answer. The reason why there were no bite and claw marks on the bones of the Gastonia is because its body was so well protected by body armor. Even something as powerful as Utah Raptor cannot bite through that armor to reach the bone below. And to make matters worse, that body armor was covered in a protective sheath of keratin. So even if the Raptor was able to leave bite marks in that keratin sheath, we would never see them because the keratin covering decomposes when the Gastonia dies, and that leaves behind no evidence whatsoever. Only the belly and legs of the Gastonia lacked armor. It protected these soft spots from predators by hugging the ground. The Utah Raptor was far more intelligent than the Gastonia, but was it smart enough to figure out a way to reach its vulnerable underbelly? The scientists worked tirelessly to find out. A 
A raptor and a thickly armored herbivore are found just feet away from each other on barren terrain. Raptor teeth are found nearby. How could the Utah raptor have possibly attacked the heavily protected Gastonia? Unlike modern day crime scenes, dinosaur remains have been stripped of all their organic material. Fossils do not actually consist of bones. They are mineral deposits that formed around the bones and continue to hold their shape even after the bones have disintegrated. Luckily, these shapes offer many clues. If you look at the physical strength comparing Utah Raptor and Gastonia, Gastonia comes out ahead. Utah Raptor, it's strong, but it's a lightly built bird-like predatory animal. Gastonia is a very solidly built animal. It has to be physically strong to carry all that body armor. So it's going to be, in just terms of sheer muscle mass, by far the more powerful of the two. Gastonia, being a large animal, was very stocky and well-muscled. A Utah raptor, for, for a predatory dinosaur, particularly a dromaeosaur, it's a very strong, powerfully built animal as well. The squat, four-legged Gastonia's heavy load slows him down to four to five miles per hour. In contrast, the two-legged Utah raptor moves with a lethal swiftness. He can sprint at speeds as fast as 20 miles per hour. There is nothing fast or agile about Gastonia. He's built like a little Sherman tank. He's very slow, he's very heavy, he plods along. He doesn't really need to be agile or fast. Utah Raptor, on the other hand, is a pretty fast, agile dinosaur. He's got to be because he's hunting and chasing prey. His body is designed to be quick. His long, stiff tail helps counterbalance him. So he's a very quick, very agile, and very fast dinosaur. Missing bones are a common occurrence when dinosaur skeletons are found. So paleontologists rely on cast replicas to fill those missing parts. By making life-size replicas of these ominous creatures, researchers may get a better visual picture of how and why they fought for survival. Casts are really important in the sense that it allows an exchange of information among universities and researchers and school children and enthusiasts. Also, seeing cast mounted museums is really great because it allows the bones to, to stay in an area where researchers can go in and look at the individual bones. It really helps shed new light on, on new discoveries. Utah Raptor stood upright and moved on two legs, which made him far more agile than the four-legged Gastonia. So if we can envision a uh, battle between uh, an animal like Utah Raptor uh, with the classic predatory tools at its disposal and Gastonia, which is an animal that was, was not fast. It was a quadruped. We just sort of stay put and hunker down and basically make it too difficult for the Utah Raptor to get a meal out of it. To make a modern analogy, think of a Utah Raptor as a wolf and Gastonia as a porcupine. In order to attack the porcupine, the wolf is going to have to be incredibly careful in choosing how and when he's going to attack. But as for the porcupine, he can just sit there and wait. Well, that's basically what we have in Utah Raptor and Gastonia. One has to do all the work and stands to lose a lot, and the other just sits by and waits. The Utah Raptor had relatively thin arms, so it cannot simply flip the heavy Gastonia over to get to its underbelly. In nature today, predatory animals are very cautious about who they attack. For instance, a single lion will rarely, if ever, take on an animal as big as a water buffalo. Now, a pride of lions will certainly do it, but a lone lion usually won't unless they are in desperate need of food. Attacking something that can defend itself is not in the best interest of the attacker. So Utah Raptor probably saw Gastonia on a daily basis, but it would think twice about attacking one unless it had no other choice. The Utah Raptor would normally have jumped on its prey's back, 
But against the armor-plated Gastonia, that would be useless. A fight between these two animals could have happened a thousand different ways. There are just too many variables to consider. So when we recreate a scenario, we try to use as much evidence and scientific fact as possible. We study the prehistoric environments, we study the skeletal design of the dinosaurs, and then other evidence so we can paint a realistic picture of what could have occurred. It's a combination of these factors that allows us to pose a realistic representation of what could have occurred. This sort of work from initial discovery to excavation and cleaning, reassembling, and final analysis can take tens of thousands of man hours. But the final result would be stunning. This dry, desolate riverbed is the casualty of a major drought. A lone Gastonia walks with his head hovering above the ground. He's trying to sniff out water for survival. His vision is poor, so his entourage of pterosaurs acts as lookouts for predators. His incredible sense of smell tells him there's water just underneath the soil. Using his front legs, the little Gastonia begins to dig. It won't take much to get to the water below. On full alert are his lookouts, the small pterosaurs. Gastonia finds a promising spot and begins digging. If he can smell water, it can't be more than a foot deep. But Utah Raptor is searching for sustenance too. Utah Raptor has been using the riverbed to hunt for dead and dying animals. He's been relegated to scavenging. There's not a lot of living things. This Utah Raptor has got to find food. Dead prey is fine, but the nutritional value of something that's died is much less than the nutritional value of fresh meat. This animal is a machine. You've got to keep the machine fueled. He's got to find fresh kill. His sense of smell is just as acute as Gastonia's. Utah Raptor prefers to ambush his prey. Chasing and fighting for his meals uses up precious energy. It also risks injury. The drought has driven him out of his favorite hunting grounds, but he will still try to use surprise as a weapon whenever he can. If he can come in quiet enough, he can reach underneath and rip the insides of the Gastonia open. But the Gastonia's lookouts are on full alert. They spot the raptor long before the raptor has a chance to run in. The pterosaurs can see every bit as well as the raptor, making them a potent alarm system. His poor eyesight doesn't spot the Utah raptor, but a sense of smell does. He's able to smell the direction the Utah raptor is coming from. So he turns broadside to his attacker. Gastonia has no claws on his feet, and his teeth are blunt. His only weapon is his massive tail scissors. The little Gastonia begins to swish his tail from side to side. The spikes that stick out from the side are very similar to the teeth on a chainsaw. If that Utah Raptor gets too close, he could have a nasty, nasty surprise. Utah Raptor will usually grasp its prey with its arms and use its heavy-duty leg claws to slash at its victim but his claws will not penetrate armor as thick as the Gastonia's. With food scarce, both dinosaurs must also conserve energy. The slow-moving Gastonia could go a week without eating. The faster raptor has a higher metabolism. He would have a hard time going more than three days. This is the disadvantage of great size. It requires a great deal of food for fuel. As the Utah Raptor closes in, the Gastonia is going to mirror every move. No matter which direction he comes from, the little Gastonia is gonna shift sideways, making sure that his flanks are protected. The normally agile Utah Raptor is handicapped on the sandy surface of the dry creek bed. His long clawed feet are better designed for hard surfaces. He's used to the forest, 
where the earth is packed hard and the trees provide cover. The Gastonia's rounded feet give him more stability maneuvering on the soft sand. When you pit Gastonia against Utah Raptor, Utah Raptor is much taller. That's of no value when the little guy you're attacking has pin cushions sticking out of his back. You're not gonna jump on his back. Height has no advantage in fighting a foe like Gastonia. In fact, it's a disadvantage. You wanna get lower than it can squat so you can get up underneath it to launch an attack. Utah Raptor knows there's a couple of places on Gastonia's body that are not protected. The underside of its legs, its underbelly, and even underneath the base of the tail. Those are the areas that he's gonna focus on when he tries to launch his attack. The Utah Raptor can jump an astounding 15 feet in the air. The Utah Raptor landing on the other side of Gastonia quickly whirls around, reaches down with his claw, and inflicts a very deep cut into the side of the little Gastonia. The Gastonia roars in pain and tries to maneuver his tail back into position, but the Utah Raptor has leaped aside. The Utah Raptor recognizes that if he can only inflict a couple of more injuries, the little Gastonia will slowly bleed to death. The Gastonia isn't smart enough to form strategy. The little Gastonia's brain is not very large, but at least it's big enough to know to learn quickly how to defend itself against this new form of attack. The Utah Raptor jumps his body once again, but little Gastonia is ready. This time, he swings his flanks towards the Utah Raptor. The Utah Raptor spins to attack, and he steps directly into the very spot that the Gastonia's tail and armor comes together. Gastonia's prehistoric scissors would be powerful enough to cut a wooden baseball bat with ease. The Gastonia's limited brain focuses on only one thing at a time. Now it's water. Utah Raptor has terrific vision, sharper than any humans. The Utah Raptor is as smart as a falcon or an eagle. It doesn't just react to its environment. It can plan ahead. And now it forms a bold new plan of attack. The Utah Raptor can use his quickness to scare and confuse his prey. He will run directly at it, limiting the time it has to react. The Utah Raptor recognizes the soft, unprotected skin on the front leg. Leaning down, he grabs the skin and pulls back. As he rips back, he rips an enormous chunk of flesh from the underside of the arm. When the raptor loses teeth, it will regrow them like a shark. The Gastonia has been injured. His front leg is in terrible pain. He can't apply a lot of weight to it. He's got to try to turn that little body now on only three legs. Instinct tells the Gastonia to lean his armored body sideways to protect where the raptor attacked. This is the moment the Utah Raptor is waiting for. This is his opportunity. He's inflicted the injury. If he can just do it a couple more times, it's goodbye to the Gastonia and game over. Even as large a dinosaur as the Gastonia would die of blood loss in three or four hours. The Utah Raptor knows that if he can inflict the same injury on the back leg as he did on the front, the Gastonia is done. But by moving to the back leg, it's the exact position the Gastonia hoped he would move to. He's near the most dangerous anti-raptor weapon ever made, the giant pair of prehistoric scissors. If the Gastonia can catch the raptor in his giant pair of tail scissors, he can break a bone and disable him. Even the raptor's three-inch round leg bone would snap like a twig. Utah 
Minotaur Raptor is much taller and certainly more agile than Gastonia. If Gastonia is going to win this battle, there's one spot on a Utah Raptor that a Gastonia can attack. That's his legs. If he can maneuver Utah Raptor towards the base of his tail, he'll have him exactly where he wants him. Gastonia pulls his legs up underneath his body to protect his underside. His tail is heavily armored, but its powerful muscles are able to move it with surprising speed. This is its only chance. The Utah Raptor has moved into the perfect position for the Gastonia. The moment that Raptor takes one more step back, he'll be able to deploy his anti-Raptor scissors. Gastonia's brain is slow, but its reflexes are quick. The tail of the Gastonia is slung forward, and these giant scissors come together and slice through the meat of the leg of this massive Utah Raptor. The shearing action is like a hedge clipper, with one blade moving over the other. The Utah Raptor tries to regain his footing, but the little Gastonia isn't done. He swings his tail from side to side like some medieval chainsaw. These sharp spikes slice through the soft skin of the Utah Raptor. He rolls to get away from this deadly attack. Gastonia has won the battle. Once Gastonia believes that the Utah Raptor is unable to continue the fight, he again returns to the business at hand, searching for water. The brain of a dinosaur is like a series of light switches. One is on and everything else is off. They think about hunting, survival, reproduction, food. The moment the little Gastonia no longer sees the Utah Raptor as a threat, he completely disregards him and goes back to his search for water. But the evidence found near Moab, Utah, gives us one last clue to what happened here. Investigators find that despite the carnage, both Utah Raptor and Gastonia managed to survive this battle. Remarkably, both dinosaurs were ultimately killed by drought. The fact that neither dinosaur had wounds on the bodies and that the bodies were relatively intact suggests that these dinosaurs didn't die in battle. They died because of environmental conditions like a drought. These individual dinosaurs lost their lives to a seasonal drought. But early in the Cretaceous period, both species would eventually lose an even bigger fight, extinction. Why Utah Raptor and Gastonia um, didn't go beyond the early Cretaceous is, is very difficult to say, other than to, um, to speculate that it was like modern extinctions due to environmental factors, uh, changes in, in patterns of, of food due to climate and things of this nature. Larger herbivores were moving in and taking advantage of the foliage that little Gastonia couldn't have reached. Larger herbivores meant larger predators came in. And even though Utah Raptor is an incredibly dangerous dinosaur, he simply got outcompeted by a bigger, more vicious kind of predator. 120 million years ago, dinosaurs were the planet's dominant species. But when conditions changed, likely due to an asteroid strike, their size and power could not help them. Too large and inflexible to adapt, they left only fossils to tell their story.